special. That's partially my, that's all, ultimately all my fault, <laughs> I should say. Uh, I, if you look at your outline, we're going to have a hard time getting through it. And I also knew that we had the pledges uh, today. And also, I told Amy I would sing because I haven't sang in like five years. So I'll put, I put myself yeah, longer than that maybe. So I, I put myself on the schedule and then I moved it. Uh, so see how that works? But uh, I am planning on, on taking a turn, but I need all the time I can get because normally I would break this uh, message into two sermons, but we're running out of time before we start our summer cottage meetings. And I want to make sure that we finish our study on dispensationalism before I begin anything else. And since we're going to do an eight-week study on grace, uh, I need to finish these seven dispensations. We're currently on the sixth dispensation. That's our current dispensation, the age of grace. And uh, the last dispensation we'll have time to study is the seventh and final dispensation, and that's the, the millennial kingdom. And so I gave you a definition for dispensationalism from C.I. Schofield. A dispensation is a period of time in which man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, I know that we have a lot to cover today. And I pray that I will use this time wisely. We'll be able to understand uh, what we need to know about this dispensation in which we live. And that, Father, our hearts will be challenged to confirm our walk in the truth, that we might be an example to a lost and dying world of the light of Jesus Christ, that the glorious gospel truth will shine to them. Father, we're so thankful for being able to live in this age of abundant grace, to have your spiritual blessings and gifts at our disposal. Father, we have more resources in this age to walk in the truth than any age before us. I pray, Father, you'll find us faithful. In the, even in the little things. Father, we are thankful for your word, that we can open it today so abundantly, freely, uh, Father, without fear. We're thankful for our military service men and women who, made, who fought to make this possible. Thank you for giving us victory. Father, thank you for giving us the greatest victory of all through your Son, our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The age of grace. Now, I mentioned when we started this uh, dispensation that grace has been displayed since the Garden of Eden. But we live in an age where God's grace has been given in greater abundance. And through the person of Jesus Christ and his incarnation on this earth, we see the fullness of the grace of God. G.W. Knight said these words, When a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay, for his time, we call that a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, we call that a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, we call that an award. Yet, receive, but when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no award, yet receives such a gift anyway. That is a good picture of God's unmerited favor, which we call grace. Grace is, as I had mentioned before, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid by his blood, and we, as believers, collect the benefits. That's grace. Grace has been at work through the ages, but why we call this dispensation the age of grace is because grace is now the ruling factor of the age. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says that we are not under law, that was the previous dispensation, but we are under grace. So we're not just talking about a picture, we're actually talking about a means to which God keeps mankind accountable. And we answer to God for what we do with the grace of God. Hebrews 10.29 talks about insulting the spirit of grace. We're not supposed to insult grace. We're supposed to live in light of grace and allow it to be our motivation for serving God. 
Listen to these verses. The Apostle Paul says this. In 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, he says, Who was before, talking about himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but the grace of the Lord was exceeding abundant. See, Paul looked at his former life and he describes it as one at injurious. In other words, he did despite the spirit of grace. But God's grace got a hold of his life and in such a great and tremendous way. Romans 5.20 says, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Ephesians 1.7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. God's grace came at the cost of Jesus' shed blood on the cross. And that's why it's so heartbreaking that in this age, even though we've seen mankind's failure in all the previous ages, you hate to see man fail where God's grace is so abundant. But unfortunately, in this age, like all the previous ages, man despises God's gift. And the dispensation ends in failure. We talked about the subjects of this dispensation. We talked about the revelation of this dispensation. Now we're going to talk about the failure of this dispensation. And it's heartbreaking. Turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This is a key phrase. If you're filling out your outline, key phrase is the truth. That phrase, the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. We know that Jesus talks about the word of God. He says, in them, in the scriptures, you think you have eternal life. And then Jesus says, and they testify of me. The truth of God, the word of God incarnate in flesh. And so this that phrase, the truth, highlights man's failure because the revelation in this dispensation is to believe the gospel. The gospel, the truth, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the revelation. And the gospel is to be preached, and the Bible says, in all the world. This revelation is for all mankind. And the Bible says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. But how does man respond to this invitation of grace, this revelation of the gospel? Well, let's look. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, start with me in verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of what? The truth, that they might be what? Saved. Oh, they could have been saved? Yeah, they could, but they weren't. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. That's very important in your theology. I hate that I have to keep saying that, that nowadays that, that very simple truth is under attack. Look at verse 12. Or let's start in verse 11 so you get some context. For this cause, because they've rejected the truth that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. In other words, they rejected the truth, and as a result, God's going to give them a lie that they're going to believe. Look what it says in verse 12, that they all might be damned who what? What did they not do? Believe not the truth but had pleasure on righteousness. Right there is the key as to why people reject the truth. They reject the truth that they might continue in sin. The truth is, is sin is, is we're accountable for our sins before a holy God. So, it's, so a lot of people just reject the existence of God so they can continue in their sin. But the truth is that God is holy, sin will be judged, and Jesus is the only deliverer. Look with me at 1 Timothy 2.4. Just go over uh, one page in my Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. It says here, Who will have all men to be saved. This is the desire of God. This is the heart of God. 
He will have all men to be saved and to come unto what? The knowledge of, there's the expression, the truth. Let me give you another verse, 2 Timothy 3, 7. Go over to 2 Timothy, just a few more pages. I know this is a lot of books of the Bible, but we're all in the proximity, aren't we? 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 7. I, it says here, ever learning and never able what? To come to the knowledge of the truth. This is a repeated phrase in the, in the epistles because this is the revelation God gave to man, the truth, which is Jesus Christ. And man's rejecting it. 2 Timothy, look over at chapter 4 and verse 4. You're right there, next chapter. And they shall turn away their ears from what? The truth. And shall be turned unto fables. You know, that describes in 2 Timothy 4, talking about the last days. I think we're living in these days. And people are turning away from the truth to pursue their own truths, which is just a lie. And will leave them damned, not saved. There are a lot of verses we could look at for this, but again, the Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Hold the truth in unrighteousness. They have it, but they hold it in unrighteousness. In other words, they put that on the shelf. Let's put the truth on the shelf so I can continue in sin. Ultimately, that failure causes them to stand before God's judgment and instead of them being able to say, but Jesus died for me. And Jesus is the judge. <laughs> and he'll say, yes, I did die for you. But you rejected me so you could have pleasure in sin. Now let's see, let's hold you accountable for those sins. I'm so glad that I don't have to stand before that judgment day. You see, the first failure of this dispensation is the rejection of Christ. And I believe that this dispensation runs all the way to the second coming of Christ. It goes through the tribulational period. Some uh, scholars believe that the tribulational period is its own dispensation. But if you notice in the, dis in, in the tribulation, they're still being called on to believe in the blood of the Lamb. And at the end of that dispensation, it's not just the Israel that turns to Christ, but it's the nations who gather together under the banner of Antichrist to war with the Lord Jesus Christ. They go to war, and Jesus comes back with the church, uh, and so the true church. And so uh, I believe this dispensation runs all the way through the tribulation. And so first we see the rejection of Christ, and then we see the apostate church. The apostate church. So the rejection of Christ, rejection of the truth, which leads in the last days to the apostate church. Look with me, you're already in 2 Timothy. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and we'll start, uh, look at verse 1. This know also that in the last days, so here we are again, the last days, perilous times shall come. And there's a long list of what those perilous times look like. And that's why I said I think we're living in them. But drop down to verse 5. It says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Okay, this is talking about this outward form of godliness, but inwardly you see what's in their heart. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. Now he's given you an image in the Old Testament. When Janus and Jambres withstood Moses and his leadership, so do these also resist what? The truth. Now wait a minute. To some people they have a form of godliness. But the picture that we're given of these is that they reject the truth. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, and how does it describe them at the end of verse 8? Reprobate concerning the faith. So in the last days, we're talking about people that have the appearance of being part of the church. 
but they resist the truth and they're reprobate concerning the faith. So they're not really the church. <laughs> now listen to this. In Jude 19 it says, and it's describing these same false teachers, and so does Second Peter, which we're going to look at in a minute. But Jude 19, verse 19 says, These be they who separate themselves, sensual, remember leading silly women astray, sensual, having not the spirit. So they have the form of belonging to the church, but to really be part of the body of Christ, we talked about this last week, to really be part of the body of Christ, what do they have to have? The indwelling spirit of God. That identifies our redemption and our regeneration. Here it says, they have that appearance again, but they have not the spirit. They have the form of godliness, but they're reprobate concerning the faith. This is what's going to happen in the last days. There's going to be an apostate church. Do you understand that what that means at the rapture is that some churches will continue having services? Because they're going to go on like they always have. Their preacher's going to be in the pulpit. He's not going to talk about Jesus Christ. They're going to still continue to, to have their singing go on. And all the people in church are going to worship and praise. And they're going to chalk up rapture to something else. Because the apostate church, they don't have the Spirit of God. They're not redeemed or regenerated. They're not going to go up. They're going to still be here. And they're going to say, hey, it's time to go to church. The apostate church, there's a number of other passages dealing with the apostate church. But this is going to be part of the signs of our failure in this dispensation. The true church is going to go up to heaven. That's a, a mercy and grace of God. And we're going to look at that. But this is part of the, the failure. The rejection of Christ globally. The apostate church. And then the false teachings of the apostate church flourish. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. See, we're still on point, main point number one. I told you I needed all the time I could get. 2 Peter chapter 2, dealing with the false teachings. In the last days, false teaching is going to flourish. And it's going to promote the apostate church. Start with me in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable her heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. How many of you ever heard of Rob Bell? He was a pastor who became a universalist, told his congregation that there is no hell and everyone's going to eventually go to heaven. You know how many he has in his congregation? About 10,000. That's 10,000 people who think that, you know, Jesus is a nice idea, but even those without Jesus, they're still going to go. So really, that minimizes Jesus' sacrifice, doesn't it? But that's okay, because it's all going to work out in the end. Not for those who are following that kind of teaching. Because that's not the truth. But here it says that they shall, in the, the future, there are going to be false teachers who are going to bring in these heresies. They're going to deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now let's get a better picture of these false teachers. Go over to chat, uh, verse 17. In case there's a, some confusion when it says denying the Lord that bought them, remember, the Lord paid for all of us. Right? Right? He died for, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. But look at this in verse 17, just to make sure we're clear. There's no indwelling Holy Spirit. All right? These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Are we talking about a believer? No, we are not. Look at the next verse. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. In other words, great sp swelling words. Great orders. Great speakers. Full of charisma. Full of interest. Funny stories. Everyone laughs. Everyone says, that's great. That's wonderful. They're shaking their heads in agreement. They leave. They're patting each other on the back because it's, that, was, that was a motivational message. There's only one problem. Who's being minimized in this preaching? Jesus Christ, the only one who can save their soul. 
And so it says, they speak great swelling words of vanity. They allure through lust of the flesh. In other words, they appeal to that nature, which is the nature of the old man. The nature that should be crucified on the cross with Christ. And they, they, they preach to the lust of the flesh through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Now it says in verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are what? Servants of corruption. So in other words, this is what that's talking about. If I tell you to pursue the lust of your flesh, those needs, that wantonness of, of your flesh, and I say, you know, you're, you have the freedom to do that. Grace is greater than sin. It's okay. You know, God will understand. What I've done is instead of leading you into a life that liberates, I've led you back into bondage. Back under... A, a life of, of sin and, and, and destruction. And so it says you're promising liberty. Oh, you've been struggling with that way too long. Just let yourself have that pleasure. Just let it go. So I'm promising that it will be liberating, but ultimately I'm bringing you into bondage. Now it says, For of whom the man is overcome, the same is he that is brought into bondage. Verse 20, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You know what this is talking about? This is talking about outward reformation, not inward transformation. This is not talking about regeneration. It's talking about they heard, they've heard the teachings of Jesus. They say, we're going to do that. And they start to reform. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter, uh, I think it was Matthew chapter uh, 12. And he says these words. He says, the latter man uh, is worse than he was in the beginning. Because he, he, the, the house, there was demons living there. The house was clean and swept. And then the demons come back and found the man still empty. And so more demons came and filled the man. In other words, he reformed himself, but he had no real spiritual transformation, no real spiritual conversion. Otherwise, the demons would have come back and found the house filled with the Spirit of God. But instead, they found the house empty. And it was free to return. And so what happens is, is this form of godliness is evident. People say, well, look, that's a, they've, they've changed their lives. But they're doing it within their own power and their own strength. It's only a matter of time until they give in to the lust of the flesh. It's only a matter of time until they go back living that way. And so here it says in verse 21, in case you're wondering about their soul, for it had been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You know what that's saying? They've known the way. They just never received the truth. And God holds people more accountable for what they have by way of knowledge. It's very clear in the scriptures that God holds us accountable to whom much is given, much is required. God holds us more accountable for the knowledge that we have. So you take people, preachers of the word of God, in these pulpits every Sunday, but they're not, they're not teaching the truth, but they have the truth. You know they're going to be held more accountable. In the case like Judas who walked with the disciples and Jesus said it would be better for that man not to have been born because he was born, he walked in the midst of the disciples but he didn't have the, he didn't have the Lord in his life. He carried the money bag. He was a thief. He was conniving. He was sneaky. But he wasn't a true follower of Jesus. Afterwards, I think he had remorse but he had no true conversion. And that's going to be what it's like in the last days. There are going to be churches all over the, the world they are going to be like this. And the false teachings flourish. And again, just very quickly because of time, uh, I put on your handouts, I don't make you fill in the blanks, the last days described, and there's two things, I'm just going to sum it up, because there's about 18 characteristics of the last days given to us in that chapter. Uh, and I'm just going to sum it up in two things. First of all, demonic violence and lovers of self more than lovers of God. Demonic violence and lovers of self more than lovers of God. In Timothy 3.1 where it says, In the last days perilous times shall come. That word perilous is translated also in Matthew chapter 8 talking about the demons of Gadara. And it says that those demons were so fierce 
that they didn't let anybody pass by them. They, 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 they pretty much attacked anyone who came into their, into their territory until Jesus came and they said, what do we have to do to thee, the most high son of God? But that's the kind of description in the last days, that perilous times, is, it's, it's a word for fierceness, violence. Uh, we don't see any of that nowadays, do we? Do you ever scratch your head how somebody could do something so violent and so unreasonable? You wonder what would possess them to do it? Well, I'll tell you what possessed the spirits of Gadara that attacked every single person that came by. It was demons. Timothy 4.1 says, In the last days they shall give heed to seducing spirits. That means demons. There will be a demonic violence in the world in the last days. And not only that, but there's a lover of self more than lovers of God. And I, I just sum it up because there's a lot of characteristics that describe this love of self. It has an effect on how we are with our neighbors, how we are with our families, our children, how we are with, uh, you know, it, it just goes on and on. But basically, self becomes the, the, the main priority of a person's life. We don't live in an age like that, do we? Where everybody's thinking for themselves, about themselves first, putting themselves first. So I'm just going to sum it up there. But the unbelieving world, when the judgment for this failure comes, in this age of grace, the unbelieving world will know that evil is real. They will know that evil exists, and it's not just a, a, in per, a person's imagination. God is going to unleash unholy angels upon them. Angels from the abyss. Fallen angels are going to be released into this world. They're going to know that evil is not just somebody's, their brains are short-circuiting. They're going to know evil is real. That Satan had fallen. He's going to be cast out in the earth before them. It's going to be abundantly evident that evil is real. And that it's not just something that Christians have talked about to try to get people to live better lives. But in the end, the rebellion will be so blatant, the defiance will be so blatant against God, that, that God is going to make it abundantly clear to them that they're being judged. They will see demons and Satan. And you think that this world is evil now, just wait when God, by His judgment, removes the restraining work of the Holy Spirit. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And thank you for bearing with me this morning. That's a lot of information. But we've got to cover it because I'm not going to have time to come back to it. The last thing I want you to have is a series, a seven-part dispensational study and not have all the dispensations. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's the judgment. First of all, the removal of the restraining work of the Holy Spirit. Start with me in chapter 2 and verse 5 of 2 Thessalonians. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Talking about the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's working. It was working back then. It's still at work today. The mystery of iniquity. And it says, Only he who now letteth, that means restraineth, will restrain or let until he be taken out of the way. Now, we, rep we apply this to the church because of the rapture. But the, the, the definition, the description here is he, a person. And the person that restrains evil in this world is the Holy Spirit. And we saw back in, in Noah's days that there was the restraining work of the Holy Spirit during the age of conscience. And that restraining of the Holy Spirit has continued through the ages and will continue to, to occur in this world. We think it's bad now. The restraining work of the Holy Spirit has been at work since the age of conscience. Imagine what's going to happen to this world when God takes him out, that restraining work out of the way. The Holy Spirit will still be working. And the dis you can see that through the tribulational study of Revelation, uh, chapter 4 through chapter 19. But it's this particular work of restraining sin, restraining evil, that God says, you know what? They want to have a reprobate mind. They want to go into this life 
uh, I'm just going to pull back, and, and it's just going to be total chaos and destruction. And it's going to be, it's going to occur because man volitionally chooses it. Not because God wants to see sin go rampant in the world that he created, but because God says, I have held you back. We think it's bad now. Imagine when the restraining work of the Holy Spirit is pulled back from this earth. And part of that restraining is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the body of Christ. When we're taken out of the way, that's a, the true church is taken out of the way. There's, again, less restraint uh, on this world. Secondly, uh, that's the next thing, is the, the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the removal of the true church. As I mentioned, the apostate church does not have the spirit. They have a form of godliness, but they're reprobate concerning the faith. They have the appearance of, they have the knowledge of righteousness. They have the, the same Bible we have, but they don't have Christ uh, in their life. And so there's the removal of the true church, those who truly belong to Jesus Christ. No believer is perfect. We're all striving uh, in our walk with God and to be more holy in this life. It's not that, I, that the call is not to perfection. The call is to fellowship uh, with God. And that means that we have to keep short accounts when we sin. When we know that we've rebelled against Him, to not allow that spirit of rebellion to continue. And, uh, and so uh, the removal of the true church, that's all those who've been washed by the blood of Christ. Even if you're not living... Right. If you're part of the true church, you're going to go in the rapture when it comes. But do you realize that wouldn't you much rather come face to face with Jesus when you're walking in obedience? Isn't that what 1 John talks about? 1 John, the end of 1 John chapter 2, he says, that you might be confident and not ashamed at his coming. I, if I had to choose between which way I got to appear before the Lord as a believer, as a child of God, I'm going to be going to heaven. The Bible even says some people are going to lose all reward, but yet they themselves will be saved so as by fire. The salvation of a believer is secure because of who God is, not because of who we are or what we've done. But here's the thing. When I appear before Him, do I want to have confidence or do I want to be ashamed? 1 John 2. Read that. It's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. It says He has given us an unction of the Holy One. He's an anointing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, that indwelling Holy Spirit is to help us walk with God. So that when that day comes, and we don't know when it's going to be, it could be today, and we're caught up before Him, how are we going to appear? Be like, oh Lord, I should have confessed that. I knew it was wrong, I just, I wanted to hold on to it. How are we going to appear? But the removal of the true church is part of the judgment on the world. Because now you've lost that witness. And then you have the remaining unbelieving world that goes through tribulation and follows Antichrist. Uh, I'm not going to read all these verses. I put, put down in your bulletin Revelation 14, 6 through 8. And, uh, and then you have the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. So the, uh, the remaining unbelieving world goes through this tribulational period. Yes, it does encompass Daniel's 70th week for Israel. But God is also judging the nations of the world. He's judging the rejection of his son. It's not just, the tribulation is not just about Israel. Uh, it's important to understand that. Uh, he is judging the nations, the unbelieving world. Just to highlight that, go ahead and turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Boy, I'm going to wrap up this last third point. You better have your pens, they're going to be smoking. The pencils are going to be smoking when you have to fill in these last four. I want to make sure you finish your outline. Well, Revelation chapter 14, this is just to highlight that this judgment is on the nations. God sends an angel to fly in the midst of heaven. It says in verse 6 of Revelation 14, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. It's everlasting because it's saving. It says, and to, and to preach to them on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and the worship and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
Now, when you see that expression in Revelation about Babylon, you've got to go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. We've got to go back to the, the earlier ages. And you go back to the Tower of Babel and you see the spirit of rebellion. God said, scatter and spread and, and, and replenish the earth after the flood. And they said, no, we're just going to be a, build a tower that's as high as heaven. That way, if God ever sends more water, we'll be way up there. That spirit of rebellion has continued to be at work from generation to generation to generation. It culminates in the tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon, where all the nations come together to make war with the Lamb. And the Bible says when the Lamb comes out of heaven, He has in His vesture dipped in blood. Because that represents what He was willing to do for them. And now they're all, willing to, they're all wanting to fight against Him. That's the culmination of the, of the rebellious heart in this world at work in this world, that in mystery of iniquity. And Jesus slays them with the sword of his mouth. The same mouth that called into creation everything in existence can just, like that. And see, that angel is going through the earth proclaiming that they fear God, that they, that they recognize they're under the judgment of God. Because God wants all men to be saved. You see, what follows the unbelieving world in the battle of Armageddon is the great white throne judgment. And that judgment is for mankind that's rejected Christ. When you read about that judgment in Revelation 20, it says, And all these that are cast in the lake of fire are those whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. All the names of those who rejected Christ. That's the failure of this dispensation of grace. Now let's lastly talk about God's intervention very quickly. As with all dispensations, there is a failure, there is a judgment, but then God always intervenes graciously. And so four things here I want you to put down for his intervention. First, the rapture. Remember, the, the apostate church goes into the tribulation. The true church is raptured out. That's God's grace to pull us out of the world before he pulls the restrainer of evil, the restrainer of sin. And then we have the two witnesses. And, and in parentheses, I'd put the 144,000 witnesses. The two witnesses have a very prominent ministry during the tribulation. And they're proclaiming the need uh, for Christ. And there are people saved in the tribulational period. People who come to the Lamb of God. They're martyred saints, it says, who've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. But God gives a witness during this time of judgment. The two witnesses, the 144,000. Then he sends the angelic messengers. We read about some of that in Revelation 14. An angelic messenger can cover a lot more ground than a person. They, it says they've gone throughout the earth. They can go throughout the earth carrying the message. Because again, even in this time of judgment and man's failure, what does God really want? People to be saved, to come to the Lamb of God, so that that blood represents them in heaven and not, not just seen as the one who's about to slay them with the words of his mouth. And so then you have the second coming of Christ. And this one I want you to turn to, and this is our last point, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm glad you bear with me this long. <laughs> There's a lot to cover in this message. Matthew chapter 24. And I'm going to read Revelation 19, 1 through 3 while you're turning there. And it says these words. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore. Now when you see that, think. The spirit of rebellion that has passed through the, the, that symbolism of Babylon. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth. Didn't just corrupt Israel. It corrupted all the nations of the earth with her fornication. And hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. 
That's the end of the judgment of the dispensation of grace where God abundantly gave of himself in an age like no other age before and man still resisted the truth and rebelled against the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at Matthew chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 22. And Jesus says this, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Another way there would be the idea of being spared. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Here's the thing that you have to read and understand from the book of Revelation. That before, at the end of Armageddon, there is not one unsaved soul left alive on the planet. The people that are left alive on the planet at the end of the battle of Armageddon are believers. That's why it says the elect's sake. They're shortened for the elect's sake. Because following the battle of Armageddon, Jesus establishes his kingdom. And when his kingdom begins, there's not one unbeliever that goes into it. You see, Matthew 24 talks about that. It talks about the one that is left and the one that is taken. And the one that is taken is the unbeliever. And God sends the fowls of the air. Now listen to this. It says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. But once you belong to God, you always belong to God. Amen? Amen? Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in, in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. But then the scripture from verse 27 to 31 describes his coming. And look at verse 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his what? Elect. He shall gather the saved from the four corners of the earth before he starts his kingdom. From one end of heaven to the other. That's God's gracious intervention. In other words, if God didn't intervene, there would not be a single soul left on the planet at the end of that period of judgments. If Jesus didn't come back when he does, every single life on the planet would be destroyed. But he comes back. And in his grace, the elect that are alive are spared. You see, God is gracious. Even in a time of judgment, he raptures the true church. Then for the unbelieving world, he sends witnesses. And then he sends angelic messengers. And then finally, for those who are, have believed during the tribulational per period, Jesus comes back and he gathers them from the four corners of the earth, spares them. When we think about the grace of God, we have to recognize that God's word says Is it av it's available to all who will receive it. God does not desire any to perish, but he wants all to be saved. He wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. The reason this dispensation has gone on as long as it has is because God is long-suffering. Even when he sends judgment, he seeks to lead man, mankind to repentance. That's why the Bible says the goodness and the severity of God leadeth men to repentance. Sometimes it's the goodness of God that gets our attention. Sometimes it's the severity of God that gets our attention. God did not have to give a gospel witness during the tribulation. But he did. Because even in judgment, he still wants men to be saved. That's how much he loves us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. I don't know about you, but I like getting gifts. Don't you? No other gifts can compare to the gift of God. I have never been in a position, my life, I've, I've been very fortunate. My parents were very stable. We always had our needs met. I never grew up in a position where my mom and dad said, we need to go to the corner and ask people to give us food. I've never been in that position. I've never had to ask for a handout. 
But you know, when you, you have to wonder, if you're in that position, you're going to wonder, how is people going to perceive you? When you ask humbly for that help, how are they going to, to look at you? But yet, despite how you're afraid somebody else might perceive you, when you're starving, you're going to ask. Right? You're like, I don't want them to look down on me. I don't want them to judge me. I don't want them to, to talk about me. But when you're starving, what are you going to do? And say, can I please have something to eat? Can my children please have something to eat? You're not going to allow your pride to interfere with your hunger and die because of starvation. But across this planet, people are dying in their sins and going to spend a life and eternity in hell because they're too proud to admit they're sinners. They're too proud to say, yes, I need Jesus. And in that pride, they won't receive God's gift of grace. Instead, they'll say, well, I'll please God on my merits. I've done a lot of good in my life. I can't see how God could not accept me. Let me just say this. If God could accept you on your merits, Jesus would not have went to the cross of Calvary. If you do not receive God's gift of grace, even though you're willing to receive so many other gifts, if you won't receive God's gifts of grace, God's gift of grace, the Bible says you'll experience a second death. The first death, that's nobody wants to experience that. But the second death is far worse. The first death, a physical death. The second death, a spiritual death. Where God casts both body and soul into the lake of fire. And when that day comes, are you going to say, but God, look at what I've done. And God's going to say, I see what you've done. Here's all the things you don't ever tell anybody about that you've done. Now here's what I've done for you. Now why didn't you receive Jesus? What are you going to say? Because what you have to say about receiving Jesus makes all the difference. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have shown us such great love in giving us a Redeemer, sending your Son to take our place on the cross of Calvary, to die our death and to deliver us from a punishment of hell and judgment. Father, we pray that we might all be humble enough to acknowledge we need your gift, that we all might be willing to admit that Spiritually, we are starving and we are dying and we need the life that Jesus can give to us. Father, I pray there's someone here today that they would not despite the spirit of grace, that they would not trample underfoot the blood of the covenant that sanctifies us, but that today they would make that decision for themselves and say, I need you. And I know that you will receive them. Because you are gracious. We give you thanks for your love. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing, Think About His Love. I hope you know His love personally. I hope that you're not trying to earn His love because God gives it to you freely. I hope on that, that when that day comes that you stand before Him that you'll know that you're there and, and have the peace of God because Jesus Christ has, has paid for the sins you've committed. I hope you know that. Let's sing this song together, and if the need of your heart is to receive Jesus, why don't you come as we sing?